Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Eddie Lee from Phoenix Ventures, uh, a VC firm based out of the Valley. Having heard Ming Liang's uh, journey to success, let us now turn our attention to building hardware startups right here in Southeast Asia. As we know, there's a global resurgence of hardware startups and even uh, phrases coined such as Internet of Things, wearables. And there has been huge M&A taking place as well. Google buying Nest for $3.2 billion, Facebook buying Oculus for $2 billion. Despite the fanfare of this eye-catching M&A, we know that building hardware startups is anything but easy. Today, we have the privilege of having four emerging hardware tech entrepreneurs here on stage. And to my left, we have Roger from Pirate 3D, Dima from Vibis, Pukit from Garuda Robotics, and Ming Wei from Bio 3D. To kick off our discussion, we, it's best that we have some context by asking each of these uh, entrepreneurs to give a short introduction about their product. So, Roger. Hey, hi everyone, how y'all doing? Um, so, Pirate 3D, what we do is that we build a consumer 3D printer that's focused on being extremely easy to use and you know, has the aesthetics that will fit into your home. Um, this project basically started out from our frustration with existing 3D printing solutions and we realized that you, know, you can't get it cheap, easy to use and good. You know, this just doesn't exist. So we created this product uh, in response to a need for you know, really easy to use consumer 3D printing. Uh, and that essentially is what Pirate 3D is. We're not exactly 100% hardware. Um, most of what we offer is actually a software solution that works together with the 3D printer and make sure that it's very easy to use, holistic user experience. Dima, you're up next. Uh, I'm Dima, co-founder of Vibis. Vibis is the first world, uh, world first wearable smart vibrator uh, that brings fantasy to life. It is a sexual wellness product for all women, including my wife. Um, our main target is mainstream market. It's not for porn industry. Because n not, not many people know like Fibrators was invented as a medical device by a medical doctor to help women to have a better orgasm. Because at the end of the day, like, orgasm, sex is part of human basic needs. And the thing is like really intrigued me was like more than 50% of women did not attain orgasm during sex, right? So this is the part like, oh wow, this is something like we can solve. Thank you. Wow, that was awesome. How do I top that off? <laughs> so, <laughs> hi, so my name is Polkid and I'm uh, one of the founders of uh, Garuda Robotics and we build uh, autonomous aerial drone systems uh, tailored to specific needs of businesses. Um, essentially, we are um, a drone as a service company. Yes, we coined that term. We invented that term. Uh, apart from that, um, you know, our flagship product is a drone operating system that runs in the cloud. So essentially, it allows you to fly not just one drone, but a fleet of drones. So you're talking about like 12 drones from your browser at any point of time, depending on your need. So essentially, what we do is uh, we have a hardware platform, which we customize based on the needs. And we solve problems that are trivial, such as um, you know, uh, providing real-time updates to construction companies about you know, how's the progress of their construction going on by flying a drone every half hour uh, that deploys itself to really hard problems like, um, uh, for example, um, a plane wreckage that's uh, you know, in the ocean and it's taking two freaking weeks to find it. And by deploying a fleet of drones that autonomously uh, goes and records live HD imagery and provides it to the operator, we can uh, you know, uh, optimize the amount of time and money it takes to perform a certain task. So essentially, uh, that's what Garuda Robotics is doing at the moment. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ming Wei from Bio3D. So we actually bring 3D printing to the next level by printing living materials. So for us, we put together 3D printing technology, uh, precision engineering, uh, as well as uh, biotechnology to create one of the world's first true bioprinter. And what I mean by true bioprinting or true bioprinter is basically instead of just printing living cells, we also print uh, other kind of biomaterials such as bacteria, chemicals, proteins, and biogels, for example. And furthermore, for our bioprinter, we not only print just the biomaterials, we can print non-biomaterials such as plastics together with biomaterials in a single session. 
So this bioprinter actually uh, creates a very powerful platform for the most demanding uh, applications. And so how do we start out for bioprinting is because we all know 3D printing is becoming the trend nowadays. And 3D printing, we can customize a lot of things. We can do it at home, we can do it in offices. So for us, uh, I'm of a bio background. So for us, we wanted to solve the current problems that we face in research. For example, the pharmaceutical industry, etc. Oh, by the way, for your information, bioprinting is not just about the 3D printing of human organs or human replacement parts. It can be the, the printing of uh, small pieces of tissues human or animal tissues for drug testing. It can be the printing of virus or bacteria colonies for this disease study. Or it can even be the printing of uh, electronics within biological tissues in a field called cybernetics, which we are actively pursuing as well. So overall, this is uh, what Bio3D does. Right. Thanks, Mingwei. Okay. Right. Now that we have heard about uh, each uh, founder's product, let's uh, talk about uh, the first topic here, which is the design manufacturing of hardware. So making hardware products is uh, intuitively extremely complex. So you and I have been uh, spoiled by the likes of Apple and uh, Samsung, who's able to give us a beautiful product such that we assume that every product in our hands is beautiful and works reliably. And the content provider, which is the software provider, only has to build their software to fit onto the screen. Now, these hardware entrepreneurs have their work cut out for them. They have to build not just the software, but also the hardware platform itself. So how is building hardware products and designing it, manufacturing it, any different from making software products? Let's hear it from the founders. Let's start from Mingwei. OK, the question is, uh, what is the difference between hardware and the software startup? In my opinion, hardware is definitely takes much longer time and uh, more courses and funds required. Because for the software startup, essentially, you focus on the app, the application itself. You focus on the infrastructure, backend, the cloud technologies, and of course, in addition to marketing and customer service. But for hardware startups like us, all of us here, uh, we have to additionally focus on the design of the, the product the prototyping, the manufacturing, the QC, the QA process, as well as uh, the logistics, which can be a nightmare. And of course, we still have our marketing and, and uh, customer side to settle on. Uh, for a hardware startup also, uh, usually for us, we have, we, it's a multidisciplinary uh, field. It involves experts from different fields, experts from engineering, experts from the computing side, from the programmers or the scientists for us. So uh, again, software and hardware, there's this major difference in my opinion. Uh, there's like a second thing about uh, B2C and B2B hardware startup. So currently, a lot of uh, hardware startups are B2C, you know, things like uh, Pirate 3D, 3D printer, uh, you know, smartwatch, wearable technology, this stuff. So a lot of times, consumers like us, we wanted it to look beautiful. Yeah, well, we wanted it to be easy to use, you know, so that we can show it off on our social media platform. But for us, for Bio3D, because we are making something that's a B2B, our customer group is actually the researchers, the scientists, engineers, and the research institutes. So for this group of people, uh, they are actually focused, the top priorities is actually on the quality of the product, on the reliability, the accuracy, and the consistency. So for us, uh, the ease of use and the cost, the pricing is actually on their second or third item in the priority list. So having said so, uh, of course, we still must work on the ease of use. Yeah, so uh, this is actually, uh, I think, one of the, the major differences. Uh, of course, another thing is uh, the group to market can be quite long for, for hardware startups. And of course, the scalability is a bit different in terms of time and cost. Yep. Got it. Thanks, Mingwei. Oh, Phuket, what do you think? I think uh, Mingwei put it out really well. Um, the truth is it really sucks to do a hardware startup because when you compare yourselves with your with other people doing software SaaS businesses, you know, you feel like, oh my God, you're losing the battle. Um, it, I mean, everything just takes too freaking long. I mean, um, especially if in our situation, it was uh, getting um, the customization of the hardware platform uh, done, uh, um, you know, tuned to the businesses that we are selling to. For example, if you're selling to a solar panel company, they want to see a thermal camera on it so that, that, so that the drone can find defects on the, to on the solar panel. So in that situation, our product had to be like completely changed, customized. Um, the the change is not exactly seamless, and because of that, um, it just takes too freaking long. A apart from that, there's not there are not many ways you can get feedback because, unlike uh, you know Roger's business, like we are doing B two B, like we sell to uh, enterprises. So um, so stuff like Kickstarter doesn't even apply. So. It's all about, it all comes down to the day when you uh, take your hardware platform and you go out there to the customers and uh, you show it to them and if it 
if it fits their needs or if you're if you really blow their minds then yeah they they will buy your product otherwise uh, you have to just try try all over again so yeah it's definitely uh, exponentially tougher than doing a software startup thanks okay Dima what do you think for your product uh, to put it simple way manufacturing is a bitch <laughs> <laughs> many people think like to make a hardware product you can just bring a prototype to a factory, give them money and say like, hey, why don't you make uh, 10,000 copy of this? It's not going to happen that way, right? Because like the whole manufacturing is uh, really complex and even big company with a big engineering teams with couples of million of dollars in the bank, like sometimes they still fail in terms of manufacturing. For like, example, recently Fitbit have to recall 1 million units of their product. So if this happened to a startup like you are dead, like there's no way like you can survive if there's any defect in your product. So we have to spend a lot of time to make sure everything is okay. And this is, manufacturing is so hard, like this is also why is the reason like there are some Kickstarter project uh, like cancel or like they never be able to ship the product. So <clears throat> having said that, like uh, actually there's one key to success uh, to, to how to build a hardware product. One of the main thing is that you, you need to actually to talk to other hardware founders or talk to other people like have, have been doing hardware product before. Uh, or the best if you can uh, apply for hardware accelerator, there's where you can learn from other people who have been there and done that before. Uh, uh, I'm part of Accelerator the hardware accelerator based in Sunchen. The reason uh, why is this is so important because you have so many people like never done hardware before and they will tell you like you should do a Toyota way, like Apple way, Samsung way, Sony way, it's, which is great, it's amazing, I love it, right? I really appreciate the, the advice. But for a hardware startup, no fucking way you can do this because like you don't have the money, you don't have the team to do it. So for hardware startup, you have to hack your way up. That's my experience. Just a reminder, everyone can only swear once. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'd like to say that you know, the reason we are into 3D printing in the first place is because um, you know, my co-founders were doing a hardware startup previously, and they found it so difficult to actually prototype their device that you know, they ended up roping me in to build a makeshift 3D printer <laughs> to print out their prototype. Um, and that's basically how Pirate 3D started. Uh, so it's nice that 3D printing is making the thing a lot easier now, but um, you know, as Dima says, manufacturing is still a bitch uh, ultimately. And that's the thing that I think as inexperienced uh, hardware founders, you know, you're going to get caught up in that first and foremost. Uh, because most of the time you just, think, you just think that it's going to be like Tony Stark's lab. You, know, you design this amazing machine with Jarvis and then poof, out comes your Iron Man suit. It doesn't quite work that way. So what happens is that you're going to have this amazing concept and then you're going to realize that your electronics do not fit into it or it's impossible to manufacture this part economically. So design for manufacture is really one very, very large minefield that you have to navigate as a hardware startup. It is extremely tricky, but if you do it well, well, you're going to have to probably a really amazing product at the end of it. Thank you. So as we have heard from the entrepreneurs that making hardware products is extremely difficult. One has to plan for reliability, one has to plan for the entire system in mind, not just the hardware but also the associated uh, software. And the entrepreneurs even have to plan ahead, not just on the design but how to manufacture, how to test for the product after it's manufactured. So uh, let's now move on to another topic. One topic that uh, I've heard that entrepreneurs like the least about their job and that's fundraising. As we have known, in the recent years, there's lots of changes in the landscape of fundraising for startups uh, because uh, angel investment became more and more popular, there's a growth of micro VC, and there's an emergence of platforms like Kickstarter or AngelList as well. So, but how is that impact on the fundraising for hardware startups as compared to software startups? Let's hear it from the entrepreneurs. What's the difference actually, raising for hardware compared to software startups? Roger. Um, well, as perhaps some of you guys may have read in the papers or read in the news, um, Pirate 3D basically raised most of our cash to a crowdfunding platform that is Kickstarter. Uh, Kickstarter is really great if you're building a consumer product, not so great if you're B2B um, because you're basically selling to consumers directly. Kickstarter is really awesome because you can unlock a, a giant load of capital um, with basically 
very little money up front. You know, we only had basic a very basic prototype when we went to Kickstarter, and but that was enough to raise that 1.4 million dollars that we used to really develop that product and get it to manufacturing. Um, but there is a, a pitfall to that. So for that, I'm going to ask Eddie a quick question. Um, so what what kind of uh, round size do you guys normally do? For us, um, we start as little as uh, even angel-like investment, um, depending on whether a round is oversubscribed. But typically, we market ourselves as a Series A or Series B investor. Series A for Silicon Valley companies, Series B for um, companies uh, over here. But we do consider all other rounds as well. Mm, um, but basically, what's, what's the round size like? Right, right. The round size um, will be typically uh, round sizes of 1 to 6 million. That will be the round size we are looking at, uh, either to take up a majority if we are leading or just to participate as a strategy in the round. Yeah, so um, I guess he's the exception. But the downside to, to raising on Kickstarter is that when you've got uh, quite a lot of capital in already, it's really hard to do your next round. And uh, if you're a little bit like me, I'm a bit silly, I didn't you know, capitalize on the, on the momentum from Kickstarter and go on a fundraising round back then. Um, it's going to be really hard to reach the next round because right now we're trying to, to raise about um, 6 to 10 million and it's not very easy unless we can you know, combine a few guys together or Eddie here comes in and uh, <laughs> gives us some cash. One, two, six, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so if, to recap, basically, it's great for consumer products to go crowdfunding. Not so great if you're going to look for the next uh, equity round. You've got to make sure that you have your roadmap lined up uh, plan ahead of your Kickstarter because Kickstarter is not the be on and all. There's, you still have to deliver your product and still have to raise your next rounds. So you need to plan ahead of that. Let's hear from Dima. So uh, for Vibis, uh, on a previous round, we have raised 100,000 from Angel Investor. And then we got uh, 130,000 US dollar from Indiegogo crowdfunding. And then uh, now we are raising for a seed round. So uh, in my experience, raising fund for uh, hardware and especially in like sex industry is much difficult than the rest, right? And from uh, from what I have is some investor they don't really un uh, some investor they don't really understand about hardware because like um, we have a product a physical product that people are willing to pay for it. By the way, uh, our revenue is six hundred thousand uh, dollars, so we have shipped about seven thousand units. We have about seven thousand units that we have to ship, and we have an app, we have a marketplace, and still some some investor like since they don't really understand about hardware, they will say like, "Oh well, uh, it doesn't sound like it it is defensible. Someone can copy it." So that is the biggest question that I always have. Like they say, if you go to China, someone will copy it. Like how are you going to defend your product? So the answer is, is simple. Like to be honest, if you look around, like there are hundreds of Fitbit clones, right? And they are really cheap and they are good too, right? But the reason is why my question is like, why nobody like really using those cheap Fitbit uh, uh, Fitbit band, right? So because it's all about the services, it is about uh, the branding and about the whole experience of using it. I mean, to make it uh, simple, like. Uh, to be honest, like, how long does it take for you to make an app, something like uh, Instagram? Like, you can make it within one month, right? Uh, even if you get it from open source, you can get it uh, within two weeks, right? So that's why sometimes, like, to be honest, like, hardware is is much uh, difficult for people to copy, and yeah, I think uh, hardware is, uh, have a better future. Yeah. Let's hear from Phuket. So, um, so for Garuda Robotics, I mean, we're still. We are about to wrap up our seed round. We're raising up to $1 million. Um, but the biggest challenge that we face over the last, we've been doing this for like four months now, and the biggest challenge we faced was uh, that um, people have very limited knowledge, and their knowledge is very restricted to uh, certain aspects of the technology. For example, uh, in the drone industry, like if you go and talk to random VCX, he would think about, Oh, Amazon drone delivery, but we all know that, you know, with current regulations, uh, such things are not possible, at least until like 2018 or something. And the real market in the drone industry lies in, you know, like the surveillance space. And it's really difficult um, for a VC who has been, or somebody who's, who's, who only has a background in SaaS to sort of come up and invest in uh, something like the drone uh, industry, right? So. That was the biggest problem. And the way we overcame this was we got people really, really excited. And we tried to convey things in the most trivial form. 
what I mean is we were at Startup Arena, uh, organized by Startup Asia again, and we were um, in Jakarta last year in November, and uh, to illustrate our uh, drone control platform, what we did was we uh, used the drone uh, to deliver a cup of coffee to a VC on the stage. And that got a lot of eyeballs. Um, and since then, you know, like things got really easy for us. People were contacting us, people who had genuine interest in the drone industry and they see where it's really going. Um, and so yeah, that really helped. And the second thing that really helped us was that um, unlike, uh, you know, a lot of hard, other hardware startups, we didn't have to invent the wheel from scratch. Like the wheel was al already there. Um, what I mean is like people have already been making drones for the last 10 years, you know, like military grade drones or even consumer level drones, right? So all we had to do was get one of these really, um, uh, you know, really durable drones that, have, that are almost military grade and apply them to um, sort of consumer level applications or applications for the enterprise. And that really simplified things, that really trimmed down the development timeline and we didn't have to build like the drone per se. So we focused on building the software and integrating that for the drone. So yeah, those were the two things that sort of really came to my mind when I thought about fundraising, so yeah. Thanks, Puki. What about Mingwei, what do you think for your product? Okay, uh, fundraising is not fun, definitely, but it's uh, quite challenging. But just like what Puket said, uh, actually the biggest challenge with uh, hardware startup sometimes can be the limited knowledge from the general public as well as the investors. Uh, because for us, for Bio3D, we are in a very specialized field in biotechnology or even medical field, the medicine. So most of the investors that we encountered are actually, uh, they are more into the info tech, you know, the IT and app application. Unfortunately for us, we cannot go to crowdfunding websites like Kickstarter or Indiegogo because we are targeting the scientists and most of them are not scientists, they are consumers. So I mean, nobody is going to buy a bioprinter at home and print a goldfish or a simple piece of meat out and eat, right? I mean, so for us, uh, the biggest hurdle is we can't utilize kickstarting or crowd, uh, crowdfunding sources. So we have to speak to investors directly, be it angel investors or VCs. So for the past one year, actually we tried speaking to various investors from the US and from Singapore. But uh, unfortunately back then, you know, bioprinting is still rather not a very popular field, I would say. It's not, they have skepticism, you know, they're skeptical about bioprinting. You mean you can print a liver out, you know? Yeah, that's impossible right now, of course. So uh, in the other end, we took a slightly different approach. We, cash is the king. So for us, we want to maintain the cash flow and to improve our revenue generation. So in fact, for us, we are already launching our product this month and we are already speaking to mostly customers from the US. Because for biotech equipment and biotech product like us, uh, our profit margin per unit is significantly higher. So for us, uh, in order to maintain the cash flow and the revenue generation, we just need to, to market it to the US. To sell a few units will be enough to, to sustain the company. So our, our, our strategy is slightly different is that we bootstrap it and we sustain the company through uh, revenues from customers, from institutes and collaborations. And eventually further down the road when we reach a state whereby we can really print a goldfish, for example, or maybe you can print a meat to eat at home, uh, then we will consider raising funds to reach a scalability stage. So right now for us, uh, we are just doing everything by, by the hard way, you know, in a way, correct. But of course the route, the route that we are taking now is significantly longer. Uh, but anyway, bioprinting is still a very new industry. It's a very infancy stage. So it's a good time for us right now to slowly enter the market and, and place our foothold. Yeah. Thanks, Thank anyway. you. So we've heard from the uh, entrepreneurs that raising for hardware is a little different. You have to raise uh, in a manner that's suitable for your hardware. If it's a B2B market, you have to find uh, investors who can understand and you have to do, go the extra mile to educate them about your product. But if your product is a consumer-focused product, then you have an advantage. You can use Indiegogo, you can use a crowdfunding platforms or Kickstarter, right? So uh, let us now move on to the next topic um, about building startups right here in, in uh, Southeast Asia. Um, as we know, a lot of the regional startups are tackling regional problems. This could be marketplaces, this could be e-commerces. And these products are essentially serving the regional market and the barrier to entry is that uh, someone else who comes in do not, are not so familiar with the local ecosystem. But in the form of hardware, uh, your product is essentially a global product, so your competitors can come from anywhere in the world. But uh, our local ecosystem has a way of supporting hardware products, I'm sure. So uh, we'd like to hear from the entrepreneurs. 
do you think uh, the local ecosystem is supporting hardware startups, or is there any areas that you wish to see improvement in? Right. Let's start from Mingwei. Okay, again for us, Bio 3D, we are into the bioprinting, which is a biotech very specialized field. So this bioprinting is actually a new field. Okay, so it's emerging in the US and the UK, the West, but not so much in the Southeast Asia. So if you're going to look up for any professors or anyone in um, Singapore or Malaysia or Philippines, most of them will not know what is bioprinting, except to print a piece of meat again. Yeah. Then uh, uh, having said so, actually setting up the HQ and a hardware startup in Singapore is very advantageous to us. Firstly, it's because of the infrastructure that is provided here in Singapore. We have institutes like ASTAR, we have universities like NTU and NUS. Uh, they provide very good support and infrastructure services to start up SMEs, you know, hardware entrepreneurs like us. Uh, again, uh, the IP issue in Singapore is also very strong. Uh, maybe I mean in China, they have their own IP system. So, but whereas in Singapore, our IP management and our IP registration and stuff like that is very strong and very well maintained. So, uh, we can be sure if we file our patents here. So, uh, so likewise, I say for Southeast Asia right now, for Bio3D, we are just planning to spread the awareness for education. We have to educate people about bioprinting. What can bioprinting do to help Maxon and, and research in the future? But most of our customers right now are based in the US. But our hardware and manufacturing will be based here in Singapore because of the reasons that I just mentioned. Okay, yeah. so thank you. What about Phuket? How do you get, uh, how, what advantage do you see in building your startup from here? Sure. So, um, First of all, it's a great honor to uh, sort of be one of the first few companies in this space, you know, sort of taking over the drone industry, you know, like we are like in the Macintosh days of uh, the personal computer industry. So obviously, um, you know, there are a lot of people in the world trying to do something similar, right? But uh, so we were originally based in Silicon Valley in San Francisco and we moved to uh, Singapore earlier this year. And the reason why we did that is because in, in the United States right now, like uh, the, according to the FAA restrictions, you cannot, you can build and design, you know, the best drones, but you, you cannot make money out of them. If you want to commercialize this technology, you have to sort of apply for a certificate. And the only companies who get the certificate are sort of companies that already work with, uh, you know, the feds like Lockheed Martin or Conoco Phillips or, you know, a bunch of other companies. So it's, so commercializing this technology in, in you know, the United States was completely ruled out. And fortunately in Singapore, uh, it's, it's a great place to be because it's easier to get into conversations with the government and talk about, you know, how, because they are the regulators, right? So especially IDA has been um, sort of really talking to us over the last few months and we've been working out a way to have, let's say, a drone framework uh, for allowing uh, a bandwidth to transfer uh, data from the drone to the cloud. And uh, with, with that in place, you know, like I definitely see that uh, even drones in public spaces, I, I can see that happening, you know, over the next few years. But for now, um, since Singapore does not have any problems with commercialization of this technology, as long as we uh, abide by the restrictions. So the restrictions are you stay below 198 feet and you stay away from, uh, you know, any airports or any, you know, uh, no fly zones, uh, which is... There, there's still plenty of space to fly. And so we stick to private properties of uh, the companies that we're operating on. For example, we're working with solar panel companies and we stick to their solar farms, we inspect their solar panels and you know, we're we are in business. So in Southeast Asia, it's, it's, it's great. Like we are, we're gonna make money. And uh, eventually, like our plan is like, we will eventually wanna go back to the valley. But as of now, Southeast Asia is the place to be for drones. Yeah. Thanks, Bukit. Diva, what about for your company? So, uh, the way I see it, Singapore, I have a question. Like, uh, how many of you think, like, if you can remember any apps or software originated from Singapore that has been used throughout the world, like in the US, in the UK, or maybe in China, right? So, imagine yourself, like, you're going to a shopping mall and you ask one of them, have you heard about this particular apps made in Singapore, right? So what is the chances? Like, I'm biased, but I think none of them, people in the US or China have been really using uh, any of the apps from Singapore. But if you ask them about like, how, how about like, have you heard about Creative Labs, Awesome, Razer, Pirate 3D, and of course, Firebase. The chances like most people, like a lot of people have heard about it or maybe they have been using it. So this is something really interesting like, the, from Singapore, 
it's only the hardware product like managed to like penetrate throughout the world. And this is the thing that I see is really interesting that Singapore has a very strong foundation for, for people to do their hardware startup in Singapore. And of course, like a lot of people have uh, impression that uh, products that come from Singapore is actually is high quality. So I still remember my time back in the days, like I got my first Creative Labs uh, sound card and I was really happy with that. And until today, like I still have a really good impression about this company. So I thought like, yeah, Singapore is the best place for you to do your hardware startup. Yeah. I second that indeed, uh, well, I'm the early user of Creative Sound Card as well. <laughs> so Roger, let's hear from you. Um, well, I'll start off by saying that Pirate 3D's Buccaneers are proudly made in Singapore. Like, uh, when's the last time you saw a product on the shelves that is a consumer, 3D pro uh, consumer electronics product that is made in Singapore? And, um, you know, the first question I always get when I tell people this is, isn't it really, really expensive? And I would say that, no, it's not that expensive. Yes, labor cost is higher here in Singapore if you want to build here. Uh, but on the plus side, you have a certificate of origin that says you're from Singapore. Therefore, you lower taxes going to a lot of countries. Um, the good thing about Singapore is that Singapore is pretty friendly with a lot of nations out there. There's a lot of free trade agreements to, let's say, the United States and other regions. Basically, if you're exporting there, they're not going to heavily tax your products when it comes in, which is a, a consideration that we had. Um, the other thing is that you know, when you are building your first product, you don't really want to start doing it in a place that's really far away. So that every time the factory runs into problems, the guy calls you up and says, hey, uh, we can't manufacture this part. There's something wrong with your design. You're going to need to come here and fix it. You know, you don't have to fly for six hours to Shenzhen to, to fix that thing. You can just take a, a, a taxi ride down to Jurong and, and, and get it done. So um, having proximity to your manufacturers helps a lot. And it's really great that Singapore actually has a very large um, manufacturing heritage. And uh, this is not just in the terms of uh, infrastructure and, and contract manufacturers who are located here. Uh, a lot of our hires as well came from the old manufacturing days of Singapore. You know, we hired guys who were like 40, 50 years old and, and they were here during the heyday in the 80s. And, and these guys have like amazing talent. You know, they basically built you know, most of our electronics and some of our mechanics out from scratch. It's crazy. Yeah. Thanks, Roger. So, um as we have heard from the entrepreneurs, building a hardware startup in Singapore comes with its advantages. We know that uh, uh, US and UK is leading the charge for cutting edge technology, but it seems that building a hardware startup out of Singapore has its advantages because you have access to talent, okay? you have access to prototyping facilities in the nearby region. And uh, it really prompts me to start asking my hardware portfolio companies to move from the valley, why not just move over here to Singapore with me? <laughs> Yeah, so um, moving on, um, is there any other points that uh, you guys have, you think should be addressed and the crowd should know about building, the specific about building a hardware startup in Singapore? Um, I think there's no doubt that software is leading the world, right? Like everybody uh, is doing apps and web apps and stuff like that. But the reality of the situation is like we're reaching a stage where um, Sort of the, the, the next next uh, few um, big giant companies, billion dollar companies, uh, there's a high probability that they will be uh, companies that do an interplay of hardware and software. So, um, and I think there has been uh, never been a better time to get on the hardware bandwagon and sort of uh, start doing hardware startups. In fact, um, you'll really have a legacy if your company is successful. So, yeah, do a hardware startup. Thanks, Pukit. So um, just to uh, thank all the founders who have been on stage helping us, uh, let's give a round of applause to them. For helping us.